Welcome. Welcome to the international premiere of the new film by Marielle Heller, Can You Ever Forgive Me? My name is Cameron Bailey. I'm the artistic director here at TIFF. I want to thank you all for coming out today to see this film. Thank, thank you. Do I have a relative in the house today? Possibly. To begin, we want to acknowledge the land that we're on today. This is a land that is the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat First Nations. They have been on this land and looking after this land for thousands of years so that we can be here and share it with them. So thank you. We're very happy to be a part of this community. This film is eligible for our most important prize. That's the Grolsch People's Choice Award. And I think you may know how that works. You vote for it. You can go online to tiff.net slash vote and vote for the films of your choice. I always remind people, vote after the film, but not during the film. Nobody wants to see your phone during the film, okay? But, yes, applause for putting your phones away. We'd like to thank Fox Searchlight Pictures for providing us with this film. They've been terrific partners of ours for years. Thank you to Steve Galula, Nancy Utley, everyone at Fox Searchlight. You know, I think that Marielle Heller has come along just when we needed her. She studied theater at the University of California. She's from Marin County in California, but she also studied in London at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. She made her directorial debut three years ago with a terrific film called The Diary of a Teenage Girl with Belle Powley. If you haven't see it, seen it, please see it. Uh, very, very strong filmmaking. And once again, uh, she's done that with her new film, Can You Ever Forgive Me? And I say she's come along just when we needed her because there's so much conversation, so much debate now about the stories by and about women in the film industry and the, the lack of them and the need for more. And when you have a filmmaker with her skill, her craft, and her willingness to dive deep into the complexities of a woman's perspective on the world and her characters, and to show us difficult women unabashedly, and to let us glory in that complexity, then that, I think, is what we all need right now. And I'm so glad that she's made this film, brought it here for you to see tonight. And she's uh, also put together a remarkable cast for this film. Um, it's a true story, and it's a remarkable true story, kind of an unbelievable true story, but it is nearly all true. And she's put together um, a cast led by the amazing Melissa McCarthy. <laughs> who I think can do anything. And she's joined uh, in the film uh, by Richard E. Grant, who is terrific. It's great to see him here as well. Marielle has come to present the film to you this afternoon. Please join me in welcoming the director of Can You Ever Forgive Me, Marielle Heller. Wow. That was the best introduction I've ever gotten. It's such an honor to be here at TIFF. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you to Toronto for having us. This is our international premiere. And we're so honored to be here. Um, Thank you so much to Fox Searchlight, who've been great partners to us in making this movie. We got asked a lot of questions about how timely this movie was when we were out talking on the red carpet about this film. And it's funny because in some ways, I do think it's very timely, but this is a movie about a different era. It's about 1991. So there's something timely about telling this story about this woman, but it's also of a different era. So we look forward to transporting you back to New York in 1991. Um, I want to thank um, some of the people who are in this room who made this movie with me before I introduce people who are going to come out here with me. Anne McCabe, my editor, who's out here. Arjun, who is my costume designer. Rebecca Breckel, script supervisor. Havala, thank you guys. And now I want to introduce some of the producers who worked with me, my partners on this movie. Ann Carey, Amy Nyakis, and David Yarnell. Thank you, 
and Jawal, who is not coming out, but who's sitting over here as well. Hi, Jawal. Thank you for being here. Um, and now I want to introduce some of our cast, and we're all going to come back to answer questions after the movie, if you stick around. Um, Christian Navarro. <laughs> Dolly Wells. Richard E. Grant and Melissa McCarthy. It's, it's like a jungle in here, it's so cool. Um, all right, well, we will let you enjoy the movie and we look forward to talking to you afterwards. Thank you so much for having us. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Carrie Craddock. I'm the director of programming for the festival. We're very fortunate to have a lot of people back for a Q&A today. Um, before I do bring them out, just a few notes on how we'd like this to go. If you have a question, raise your hands high, wave them around, especially if you're up there under the balcony lights. I'll try my best to get to as many of you as I can, and I will always try to repeat the question for the benefit of everybody else here. Okay. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming back to the stage the director of Can You Ever Forgive Me, Marielle Heller. Thank you guys, thank you for staying. I'm gonna bring back out our producers and cast, Anne Carey, Amy Nyakis, David Yarnell, Christian Navarro, Dolly Wells, Richard E. Grant, and Melissa McCarthy. I think I'd like to start this one um, by asking you, Marielle, um, how you became familiar with Lee's story and what sort of inspired you to make this movie. So Anne Carey right here brought me this project. She and David Yarnell are the two people on this stage who actually really knew Lee. Um, David actually encouraged Lee to write this as a book and Anne optioned the book from Lee, had many a uh, a drunken lunch with her, as, as I hear, um, in order to kind of start this whole process many, many years ago. So I was lucky enough to come on board when this project was kind of well into its development. Um, Would either of you like to say anything about Go ahead. It? Knowing Lee. And when I met Lee, she, she, I had to meet her before she'd give me the option because she wanted to see if she would approve me. And I think, um, and David had to approve me. Um, and our executive producer, uh, Jual, who's out there somewhere in the audience, has also been a part of the early trip, but it was really about having her vet us. And uh, I guess we, we passed muster. And all you young people out there, it only took nine years, so keep on going with your stuff. <laughs> Um, I, one of the things I remember most about the film is just the feeling that you really put us in her world and into this very literary space. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the production design and some of the choices you made there. I think we all were sort of in love with this idea of going back in time in, to a time in New York City that's kind of gone um, when artists still lived in Manhattan. <laughs> and, um, and we were trying to explore the real bookstores. A lot of the, the places we shot were the real bookstores where Lee actually sold her letters. Some of the, them were the places she was caught. Um, we felt kind of like it was this race to get these beautiful old bookstores on in our movie before they were gone. There were some closing down as we were location scouting. So it really felt like we were trying to capture an era that was slipping through our fingers as we went. And Julius's, and Julius's the bar, is where she really drank. And it's one of the oldest gay bars in New York. And um, all the bartenders there knew her. Actually, all the barflies who normally would have been drinking there while we were shooting there went down the street and all raised a glass to Lee while we took over their bar. It was very sweet. Um, I'd like to ask a question for Melissa and maybe Richard on stage about how familiar you were with her story or with the material and what your kind of preparation was in terms of maybe reading some of these infamous letters. Um, I was not familiar with Lee and I think that I felt disappointed in myself that I, I didn't know who she was and I didn't know 
her story. And I, I was in New York during that time period, and I felt I was at Julius's many a time. And I just thought, my God, I, I could have passed her at any moment. And then once I read it, I just thought, she's so fascinating, I wish I had. And then once I started reading her books and everything, she's just, what an incredible story in life. So I feel very lucky to have gotten to uh, walk in her shoes a bit. I'd read her Tallulah Bankhead uh, biography, but what, what I thought was so poignant about this story is that uh, she wasn't, she was self-effacing. She, so I felt that when I was reading the Tallulah Bankhead story, I was reading that, and I didn't register that particularly there was Lee Israel, and I think that's what the film deals with as well at that moment in the 90s when pre-celebrity culture as we know it now were, as Tom Clancy had to be famous in order to sell Tom Clancy, other than his stories, uh, she, Tallulah Bankhead was the seller, not Lee Israel. Okay, I'd like to open it up to you guys. Is there a question from the audience? Yes, towards the back on the main floor here. Yep. Go ahead. <laughs> so, maybe we should just acknowledge Melissa's amazing performance. Yes. And if you could perhaps comment on your own thoughts about what this performance means to you and what you might expect. What I really love is that more people will know Lee's story. They will know, uh, like I did not know who Lee Israel was, and I love the thought of them discovering her and discovering her work and then maybe taking a look at all these people that pass us every single day and looking at them differently. I feel... Lee is such an incredible story of maybe the invisible person that you pass a million times a day and now I look at people differently and I think, I wonder what that person's life is really like. I wonder what she does. I wonder what his story is. So I think spreading like with Mari did with her incredible directing, I think sharing a little bit of humanity, um, I would like to spread that on social media <laughs> maybe more, <laughs> except I don't know how to use it. Okay, is there another question in the audience? I'm looking down here somewhere. Yes, on the aisle with the glasses. Go ahead. Thank you. He, he was originally uh, in this before, so I, uh, I squeezed my way into his movie. Ben? He was, ben, ben had that part uh, way before me, so. I'm, That's I true. Know, yeah, right? Ben, ben is the reason that Melissa is here, actually. This, really? this project had a different life before, and you know, movies are like a miracle when they actually get made, and it had fallen apart one other time before. Melissa wasn't involved, and I wasn't involved, but Ben was. And the reason Melissa picked up the script was because Ben was attached to it and was friends with the people who were making it and had written it, and so she read it. That's, it's just a random course of events that led to her being here today. But I like him too, a lot. <laughs> okay, are there any more questions out there? Yes, towards the back in one of the pods here, yeah. Um, so maybe this one is a question for Marielle, if you could talk a little bit about the sort of queer aspects of the film and that sort of lens in the storytelling. You know, um, we all did a lot of research when coming to this movie, and I think one of the things I was so struck by when thinking about 1991 in New York, and particularly queer people in 91 in New York, is it was at the height of the AIDS epidemic. And um, there was something interesting that was happening between the gay community and the lesbian community, too, where these were two communities that had largely been separate and were coming together because of the AIDS crisis. A lot of men were being abandoned by their families, Lesbians were coming out and helping and supporting and taking care of a lot of men who were dying. So there was some crossover that was happening in New York at that time, cross-pollination, sort of. I was struck by that. I was struck by um, what that time in history was for my city. I live in New York now. I didn't live in New York in 91. But um, my aunt was in New York at that time, frequenting these bars and giving me her stories about this lifestyle, Lee's kind of lifestyle in New York. Um, so although the, the movies, we, we never viewed it necessarily as that wasn't, it wasn't an issues movie. This is a movie about two people 
um, who are very lonely in their lives, who find each other at a moment when, for various reasons, they have different reasons to be alone. Um, and we were just touched by that history, I think. Okay, are there any other questions? I thought I saw some hands over here, yes, on the left in the pod there. It's a comment Thank about you. how fabulous everybody is on stage. Um, so I thought I saw somebody. Why can't I see anything today? Yes, stand up. Thank you. Um, so the question was about getting into Lee's backstory and what her issues were around trust and kind of how she maybe got to the place where we meet her in this film. Maybe Marielle and Melissa, you could both answer that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, um, you know, the script, Jeff Witte and Nicole Hall of Center wrote the script and the, there were many versions of the script, but it was based on her memoir. So it was really focused on this one period of her life, which was these forgeries, which she believed, I think in many ways, were some of her best work. Um, and so we never viewed it as like a biopic of Lee Israel. It really wasn't. It was much more a, a focus on this, this period of her life. And I like when movies kind of just throw you in and you have to figure out why someone is the way they are. I feel like that's part of the fun, right? Is sort of bit by bit, I think she starts off with such a hard shell and then slowly we kind of chip away at it and we get to know her and all of the ways in which she's vulnerable and I think it's so much more rewarding to have those things come slowly as you go along rather than just being there on the surface right off the bat. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I, I, I look for so many things on Lee and I'm, from what I've learned, Lee didn't want you to know things um, about her unless she wrote them and so we really had to kind of conjure things and and I loved how it was laid out and I always thought it was a bit of the mystery and again a bit of a learning exercise for me of like why is anyone like that and even if someone is like that on the outside what I kind of fell in love with Lee about is that she still had this heart in her she just kept a prickly shell around her so I don't know it was, I found it fascinating. Um, if there's no other, oh, yeah, we can go to the balcony. You're standing up. Uh, can you talk about the music choices in the film? Yes. They were beautiful. David Yarnell here gave us a list of songs Lee really loved. And we used that as an inspiration and jumping off point, both for all the source music in the movie. She really loved female jazz singers, particularly like Blossom Deary, Jerry Southern. Um, and our composer used those sort of themes and musical arrangements to kind of try and create a score that was sort of in Lee's world as well. But we love it too, and it's gonna come out as an album on vinyl, so you can get it. There was another question from the balcony that I wanted to get to. You see, yes, in the middle, go ahead. Um, for all of the actors on stage, maybe we can start with Dolly and you could each talk a bit about what was the most difficult scene for you to film. Um, well, I had, first of all, I just had a really nice time, so it, wasn't, it didn't ever feel as difficult as it should have. Um, the scene, the dinner scene, just because he didn't want to make it mawkish, um, so maybe there was a feeling of wanting it to be this, I mean, that's what's so sad. I've seen this three times and I was st still crying watching it just now. But that, you've, that, that it wanted to be this moment where they could have, that it could have been the beginning of something so lovely, but that through Anna's sort of naivety and coming forward to Lee, that Lee had to come back. And so I suppose it was just trying not to do too much or something, trying to make it real without being sappy, or, I think. I know, I was rooting for them, which I know makes me insane because I, I know what happens. <laughs> but I was like, every time I watch it, I'm like, oh, just kiss her, kiss her, you dummy. Um, I, I mean, there were, there were so many, I don't know, things can be difficult and then still incredibly rewarding. I still can't watch any, I don't get through the things when uh, Jack gets ill and you know he's ill and we're breaking up. <laughs> I can barely talk about it. Yikes! Um, yeah, I get. I still can't. He's. Do you like that? I won't look at you. <laughs> um, he's. You know, Richard. He. 
I'm just now thumb jerking at this one. Um, Richard was so amazing to work with and, and we filmed that right toward the end, very end of the movie actually, and that was uh, incredibly difficult just because I really feel so much for Richard and I felt like those characters had really fallen in love. So that was tricky, but, but lovely and I think important to be told, so. <laughs> Um, that is all we're going to have time for, but I think thank you for bringing these characters to the screen and this story here. Congratulations.